The views and opinions of this broadcast do not reflect the views and opinions of Armed Media, Unew Productions and its affiliates. Enjoy the show. evening and welcome to Let's Talk Careers with Sarah on Armed Radio. Today is Wednesday, July 18, uh, 10 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm so glad to know that you are out there seeking to know all the answers to get your dream job. And with me, you can um, ask questions on Facebook, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah, and you can join my group. Let's talk careers in our circle and ask all questions that you have and also have the other members in the group answer your questions and um, post any job offerings that you have in your area. So today I'm going to ask you, uh, not actually ask you, but about uh, talk about how you can be a star performer at your current job. And uh, you don't have to work 18 hours a day to be a star performer. On average, the star performer worked fewer hours. And then the words they don't, um, then the hours, then, um, then the usual hours that people do work. So usually we work eight hours a day and not 18 hours a day. Uh, so on average the star performer worked fewer hours than the average performer and that's encouraging because in other words you don't have to dedicate every waking hour to the company in order to become a star performer and why is it so valuable to be a star performer for one thing people who are star performers are self-confident they have about they have about them an air of confidence they understand that they they understand that they are going to make mistakes, that they aren't going to win every deal, but they have confidence that they know they don't have to win every deal to be successful. Moreover, success breeds success. It seems to be one of the strange rules of the universe that good things happen to people who are doing good things. The converse also seems to be true. If you're on your way down the ladder, half the rungs are going to be missing. There is an old saying that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. There may be more truth about than poetry. A third reason why it's so valuable to be a star performer is that winners like to do business with winners. They don't want to get your car worked on by a mediocre mechanic, do you? Neither do I. When you are successful, other people who are successful naturally start gravitating toward you. Bottom line, stars make more money, tend to be more satisfied, and have more fun. So Jazz, how do you become a stellar performer? Think in terms of small steps. Nothing is truer of process. You eat the elephant one bite at a time. If you are smart, one small bite at a time. Whether you are a financial planner, a busboy in a restaurant with aspirations to be a waiter, a teacher, a salesperson, or a midline manager, don't think it's going to happen overnight. That's simply a great setup for failure because you are not going to achieve what you want to as quickly as you want to and you are going to end up frustrated and discouraged. Take small steps. You will be much better off in the long run. Also, you must continue to do research on a regular basis. 20 to 30 minutes a day is usually sufficient. Take the time to read the relevant periodical, scan the internet for information pertaining to your job. Talk to others in your field. There is some great information out there about what's going on in the marketplace. Keep up with the latest books on your industry. The main thing is to do daily research on your industry. You'll be surprised how it's going to help you in the future. And the reason you'll be surprised is that most people don't do it. 
You may well turn out to be the only kid on your career block who knows what's going on in your area of expertise. Now, um, also you can ask management in your company what you can do to make yourself more valuable. Go to them proactively and say, I'd like to be more valuable to the company. How do I go about doing it? That accomplishes a couple of things. It lets management know that you are serious about your career and it earns you some gratitude that will come in handy at, uh, at some future time. Ask for assignments no one else wants. There are always those unglamorous tasks that no one wants to do. Maybe they take too much time, they are hard to do, they are thankless. Whatever the reason, ask if they need some help with quarterly reports or the inventory things that people find time consuming and boring. I'll guarantee you, you'll get to, to help. And it is this surefire way to make yourself into a star performer. Present management with a plan to improve problem our areas at work. We all know what the problems are. After all, we all like to bitch and complain about them. But how many of us are willing to do anything about them? Well, the star performers come up with ideas and plans to improve those problem areas. I'm not talking about a 50-page document to be published in a journal, a one or two-page memo saying, hey, I think we have a problem here and this is what I think we can do about it. Maybe it's a plan to reduce accounts receivable or just some way to ensure that incoming phone calls don't get lost between the cracks. Also, offer to assist fellow employees on their project after hours. Obviously, you have to use work time for your own work and projects. Just be careful. You don't get too distracted. You can spread yourself too thin, but you can offer your assistance selectively. Maybe someone's been out sick a couple of days, just bugged down. Maybe someone in customer service has been asked for a bunch of reports and doesn't have time to do anything else. I j j Just go to that person and say, I know you're buried in stuff this week and I've got a couple of hours after work on Thursday. Okay, if I give you a hand, the person will never forget you, never guaranteed, and he or she will tell at least half a dozen people about it. You know the daily to-do list that so many of us make? Then proudly smile as we take things off the list. That's done, that's done, boy I feel good. Only nine more to go. Well, star performers put things on the list. They don't focus primarily on taking things off. Though that obviously gets done, they focus on what other things they can do. And give others the credit when things go well. Of course it's possible to overdo things like this, and if it is becomes insincere, people know it and become resentful. But at the appropriate time, when the situation calls for it, give other people the credit, even though you may have been the main architect of the success. Why? Because you will find lots of people who want to get on your bus, who will want to be part of good things, part of an experience where they feel valued. Oh, you'll find the occasional employee who is resentful or envious. It is perhaps an unavoidable part of your journey. But if you stay focused on the process, on the little things that endanger I'm sorry, engender success, you will become a star performer. That is the way to start building confidence so that you believe it's possible to improve not only your work performance, but your work or life balance as well. When people ask about the work-life balance, I simply tell them that if things are going really well in one part of your life, chances are good that that outlook will spread into other areas. We certainly know the reverse is true. If you are having a terrible time with your significant other or with some outfit trying to repro your car, uh, that sense of gloom is likely to spread to your work as well. And of course, if you are having an awful time at work, remember how much of our lives we spend there. Chances are good that your home life will be affected as well. As you begin to put the above steps into actions, right, as I mentioned before, 
you will begin to understand that you really don't have to be a rocket scientist or forfeit every waking hour to your job to excel at work. But how do you maintain that self-confidence over a period of time? There are a couple of other key things I see star performers do that we can all learn from. First, they have a better sense of understanding which relationships are important to their careers and which ones aren't. Who you associate with has a tendency to reflect and determine what your performance is. Oh, you can be a star performer on a bad team, but your chances are much better on a good team. That may seem a little at odds with what you have been taught conventional wisdom has it that it is easier to stand out as a top performer in a small pond, not in a business. It's easier to do well when your company and those around you are good performers. Some relationships can help you in your career and others can't. People that are energy draining or energy dependent fall into the latter category. Now, there is nothing wrong with giving people a power boost from time to time and actually that's a good thing to do but people of the energy drain persuasion can never get enough you'll get run down and they will still be needy you will not have helped them they will only be more convinced that ev- than ever that they need you while that may be flattering to your ego it's not going to do a thing for your status as a performer at work You want to focus on relationships where there is a positive energy exchange. You do great things for people. They do great things for you. That's the equation to focus on. Top performers also tend to streamline the number of people they work with. That doesn't mean you have to stop talking to people in the hall or ignore those around you. But it goes back to the old 80-20 rule. 80% of our success comes from 20% of our efforts. You need to nurture those relationships that represent the 20%. You cannot be all things to all people. Some famous said that, but I can't remember who. But you cannot be all things to all people. Being of service or of use is a tremendous positive as long as you don't overcommit yourself. It builds a momentum and self-confidence Two important ingredients in a top performer. But if you are going to be a partner, either with your company or fellow worker, be a good partner or don't be one at all. My own experience tells me that sometimes when I am working with a client or working on a business deal, the fit just isn't there for whatever reason. And some of them may be hidden. We weren't able to form a partnership that did either one of us any good. I've had to go to those people and say, it's just not working. I can't hold up my end of the bargain and do what I said I could do. It's best we put it on the back burner for now, maybe even off the stove. That's being a good partner. It's being open and honest about what you can do and what you can't do. People respect that. What people don't respect is when fellow employees say they are going to do something, don't follow through, and then offer all kinds of excuses about why they couldn't get it done. You'll be far better off by being open and honest and upfront. A final thought about relationships and the part they play in becoming a star performer. Some of my clients ask me about jealousy or envy and how to deal with it. Not pretty emotions, but unfortunately fairly common in the workplace where some people get ahead faster or at a younger age than others. I suggest you need to deal with it head on. Take the person to lunch or coffee. Address it. Something like, I understand from the grapevine that you are a little miffed over my promotion. I just want you to know that I understand the feeling. When Frank got his promotion last month, I'm just giving you a name, Frank, got his promotion last month, I was more than jealous myself. I went to him and more or less told him so, and I ended up asking how I could learn from his success. It turned out to be a great conversation. Essentially, 
What you want to do is diffuse the situation. Take action. If you don't, the jealousy will return into anger, which will turn into resentment, and then everybody loses. Deal with the situation and move on. Once you're building positive relationships and beginning to see the benefits, what are the things you can do to advance to the next level, have a clear roadmap, stay focused, and try as much as possible to be detached from the results. Now, when I say results, don't focus on results. You must keep focused on the process, on doing the small things right every day. The results will come, believe me. If you are a secretary and your goal is to handle each call in under 30 seconds, you might end up alienating more than a few customers in your quest to get them off the phone just to meet the goal. And remember, those ads about getting your pizza in less than 30 minutes? It seems to me it's a surefire way to increase accidents and speeding tickets, all to ensure an intermediate goal intermediate call what's the real goal customer satisfaction stay focused on that for whatever profession you have customer satisfaction is most important than anything else top performers ask for help when they need it they ask for feedback in an effort to improve their performance remember that what you do determines where you end up on the corporate ladder so I'll share with you a case study um, that I had encountered um, a while back. And I am going to explain here what, um, what happened, what was the problem, and how it was resolved. Barry was what you could generously term a mediocre salesperson. I worked with him when I was still a senior manager in the corporate world. He was a likable guy, worked long hours, but never seemed to have a great success. We first worked on getting him focused. Barry was a classic example of someone who spread himself too thin. He helped everybody. We worked for an office products distribution outfit, and Barry would work the phones help in the warehouse, unload trucks, anything and everything. Now, there may be times when it's necessary to do that, but if you do it all the time, you are not helping anyone. What happens is that your own sales goes down. There is less staff in the warehouse and less staff on the truck. We worked on controlling how much time we spent on his own business. While still finding time to help out others here and there, as you might imagine, Barry has a great people skills and everybody loves him, but now he's proportioning him his time properly. As a result, he's more focused and he is a lot more effective and he is now one of the top salespeople with the same company. Just a small adjustment but a big payoff. Now I'll give you the second uh, case study which is a dental hygienist who wanted to move forward but felt stuck in her job. Some jobs tend to have built-in limitations and dental hygienist happens to be one of those. If you don't want to go back to school and become a dentist, there is only so much room in which to maneuver. She wanted to make more money, have more interesting cases. I suggest that she go take some night courses, study new techniques, new concepts of hygiene, just see what was available. She started doing her research. You remember research, research, and research? And discovered that there were new services available that hygienists could provide. So she went to her boss and simply said, I can be more valuable to you if you will send me to this school. Route planning, I think, but don't hold me onto that. We can provide additional value and increase profits by making this service available to our customers. The dentist thought it was a good idea, who wouldn't, and sent her to school. They increased their customer base, she became the lead hygienist, and ended up getting a percentage of the root planning business. Positive thing for everybody, the classic win-win scenario we all look for. The biggest obstacle to overcome is the belief that we are not capable of being more than we are or doing more than we do. The old 
bromide about creating your own life experience holds true for your job experience. So looking at these two scenarios, you can just plan ahead of what needs to what, what your focus is and how you can help your manager or your supervisor with the job that you already do. Now I want to advise you that you should stop underestimating yourself and start doing the small thing we talked about that will give you that will give you the confidence to move forward toward creating a positive job experience. You can do it. I've seen thousands of people do it. Some certainly no more talented than you. It works. Go for it. Now, when I say you should become a star performer, you probably will say, what, me, a star performer? Who am I to be a star? Now, the very idea of becoming a star performer has you squirming, doesn't it? So before we learn about what it takes to become a star performer, let's look at your resistance to becoming a star performer. No need to get deeply psychological here. I just want to know what might stop you. First, I will just just um, suggest that you should be introducing the inner critic. We all have a running commentary going on in our heads, providing us with negative opinions about our work, our life, our appearance, our overall worth as a human being. And it happens to everyone. You have that inner voice that tells you, that critiques you. And it's the voice that says, you don't, you didn't do that quite right. Someone else could have done it better. And your hair is a mess, by the way. That commentary is being given to you by your inner critic. The more an action has the potential to create change, the louder your critic will become. Your critique won't offer an opinion about which brand of mayonnaise to buy at the grocery store, but when you consider offering an innovative proposal to your boss or looking into a new career path, be ready for a critique attack. Who are you to share your ideas? No one wants to hear that, and you'd better not share them because your boss is bound to say no, and then you will look foolish. The critique wants you to believe that. The only possible outcomes are embarrassment, a loss of respect, and knowing your luck getting summarily fired. The critique speaks with with such authority that it really does sound like it is speaking in capital T, truths, right? Handed down from a high on stone tablet. In actuality, the critique simply offers one scenario, usually the worst case, such as proposal might equally well lead to a bonus or promotion, but your critique will never suggest that. The critique will declare it's bound to fail because you doing it, and you are bound to screw it up. Just look at what happened when you asked that pretty girl to dance when you were 17. She said no, and you felt really bad. Want to go through that again? When we listen to the critique, What we get in the status quo, because any change feels like it might threaten the security and success we have. There is not necessarily anything wrong with the status quo if it's working for you. But I have a hunch that if you're reading this, uh, if you're reading this mindset, right, and you are listening to me right now, you want more from your career than you have at the moment. More means change. And effective change means taming that critique. So your job is to identify the voice of your critique so that when he shows up, you know what to do. So I'm going to ask you questions and see where you are now. So is your career directed by your critique? When you talk about your career, the words should, must, have to, and can't show up all over the place. You don't like where you are, but you feel afraid to change it. You think all the time about what to do next, but you do take, do not take any action. When you start to think of a better future, you find yourself thinking, it's not too bad where I am. 
I can stick it out a few more years. I could do worse. The critique will talk you into settling for an unsatisfying life and tolerating the intolerable. You see problems and potential pitfalls in every plan you make. You are so aware of what, you, of what might go wrong that you find it hard or even see what might go right. You can talk yourself out of anything that might change the status quo. You are very concerned about what other people may think, what they think of you were foolish to change careers, uh, misguided, gullible. You argue for the old rules. It has always been this way. It will always be this way. You are basically powerless to change anything, a passive victim of market forces and corporate culture. Being a star performer is for people with more talent than you. The career coach must be talking about the kind of people who got straight A's in college and have been in the fast track ever since. Not me. Now, this, what I said right now, it's your inner critique telling you this. Not me. It's your inner critique. You have to be like cognizant and I know you know it. And I know you heard yourself saying it in your mind. Your critique will never agree that you could be a star performer. Never. Don't try and convince it since it will help you all the reasons why you can't. In fact, your critique will resist most of the new ideas what, what, what I'm saying this in my shows. Okay? Now, your critique will always be there. Offering you his commentary, silencing the critique is impossible. There's probably something hardwired into being human about fear of change. However, once you recognize that, despite the authority of critique, critique's voice, what he says is simply a point of view and not the capital T, truth. It's possible to put his opinions aside and choose again. Do not try the, to please your critique. It's impossible. Nothing is ever good enough for critique. A client of mine said that her gremlin was just like her mother. If she got an A in a class, her mother would ask, why didn't you get an A plus? When you notice your critique speaking, say thanks for sharing and look for another way of looking. If the critique represents pessimism and fear, why would an optimist say about this, his situation? If you can find another perspective, you automatically separate from your critique and he loses power over you. Try using the perspective of a change agent or star performer. What would a change agent do in this situation? What would a star performer do? You need to know, by the way, that the critique is universal. In other words, everyone is afraid of not being good enough, smart enough, slim enough, or hardworking enough, even star performers. Star performers are the people who are able to take action in the face of their fear rather than being paralyzed by it. So experienced critique tamers know that when the critique is loudest, you are on to something. The idea you just had or the option you are considering has the potential to create real change in the status quo. So for one week, pretend to be a star performer even if you don't feel like one. So I'm going to give you a formula. Practice as many of these steps as you can this week. If you don't apply all of them, it's okay, no matter what your critique may say. Think small steps. Take your time. Do your research. Ask management what you can do to make yourself more valuable. Ask for assignments no one else wants. Create plans to solve problems areas at work. Assist colleagues who are overwhelmed. Add things to your to-do list. Expand the range and scope of your impact. Give others the credit. Focus on the important relationships. Focus on process, not results. Stop underestimating yourself. And during this thing, this week, keep track of the following. Count the number of times your critique showed up. If you are like most people, you will lose count before the end of the first day practicing being a star performer. 
What did your critique have to say? Does he use the same stick to beat you with all the time? Or does he have a range of weapons at his disposal? Which aspect of being star performer got the critique most ag agitated? That is the one which has the potential to make the greatest difference in your career. When you get a positive outcome for one of your star performer actions, what does your critique say about it? How does he try and discount it? When you succeeded in meeting a goal your critique said was impossible, did he shift his attack to another area? By the end of the week, you will see that your critique has a distinct personality and a couple of consistent ways of making you really afraid. If there is one thing to learn from this whole exercise that I told right now, it is your critique, not you, who is resistant to your becoming a star performer. You want a great, fulfilling career where you can get to fulfill your potential. Your critique wants the status quo. You want to get on the basketball court and make a difference. Be a player. Your critique wants to sit in the stands making cynical comments about the game without participating in it. So, if you have missed, if you have missed some of my questions or my steps or my guidance, just go on to Facebook, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah, and you will see um, the recording in there so you can hear it. And I have also previous recordings of these shows that I had in the past weeks that you can um, hear it at any time in your own time and take notes. And if you want to reach out to me and ask questions regarding your uh, promotions, you can reach out to me on Facebook, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah, and then just message me there and I'll contact you. And if you have, if you don't have Facebook, then just message me on uh, on the email, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah at gmail.com, and I will respond to the email at your earliest convenience. So this is just about how you can get promotions what I talked about right now. So this is something that you should be considering and not letting this fly by and thinking I'm comfortable where I am and I'm good. But then you're resenting your friends who are getting the raise and you don't. And then you're resenting the friends who are being promoted as a manager and now they are your supervisor, they are your boss now, and you resent that because they took actions. They listen to the shows. They do homework, they do research, they are not settling like you do. So you don't want to settle. Just go and be a star player, a star performer. So now I want to give you another exercise, thinking that how you can develop the skills that you have in your work. So developing the skills is basically... Um, you need to assess how your actions affect your company's business. If necessary, by asking your boss of his opinion, where is there, is there a room for improvement? So what are you hoping might happen in your career? What actions could you take now to increase the chances or better still stack the, stack the deck in your favor? And what would be a better way to do one aspect of your current job? and find an obstacle to remove it. And also think, what are you really good at? What do you love to do? And how can you work this into a daily fabric of the job you have? If you can't see a way in your current position, what work environment would value and reward, reward these kinds of skills? And then also ask yourself, what impact do you have on your colleagues? Write down what you think about yourself and then go interview at least three colleagues. Listen for consistent themes in the way they, in what they say. Now, I just want to emphasize, you need to be willing to abandon any ideas of how you are perceived if they are not shared by your colleagues. Build around the strength 
that other people can see. And then think, what will trigger you to judge others negatively? Is it laziness? Is it gossip? Is it a logic? What impact do you think your judgments have on your co-workers? And what impact do your judgments have on your effectiveness? What will consistently trigger self-criticism in you? Looking foolish? Missing a deadline? What will it take for you to learn from these situations? Forgive yourself and move on. Ask a colleague to assess your communication skills. Do they understand you when you talk? Find a communication buddy when you have an important proposal to make or an interview. Practice with a buddy. Focus less on content and more on the clarity and economy in your speaking. Find at least three classes on a communication skills. Take a minimum of one per year. Believe me, communication, I emphasized in my last show, is the most effective way. I cannot communicate with someone who doesn't communicate back. I'm not going to chase you to get an answer from you. It's not how it works, and people lack it. They think they're great communicators, but when they write a paper, they are not great writers. They don't communicate their ideas effectively. Not in the email, not in the text, not in the messages, nothing. So communication skills is a must. And some people will say, oh, I told you X, but I meant Y, you know. And for me, it's like, listen, you meant Y, but I thought you meant X. So if it's not clear, you are losing out. And then think about your, um, uh, where is your company going? What is a strategic plan? How do you contribute to it? If you don't know the answers to any of this, ask. Ask your boss. From your research, identify three ways to ensure that your work makes the maximum impact. What tech skills would you make your make you more effective in the workplace? What skills would make you more marketable, right? So we need to know the technology out there that is now should be used i know that some companies don't use any new technology because they're not aware of it if you come up to them and say listen this technology will help you organize the work will help you see the reports together share the reports together if i'm giving you an example of crm for example right and your boss doesn't know what crm means and he's been in the business for 50 years and he's using Excel sheets in, uh, instead, right, to, re- to record all of this information. And then you show up to him and say, listen, I read about CRM. Maybe we should implement that. It costs X, Y, Z, and it does X, Y, Z. You know, this will be so much valuable for your boss. So tech skills will make you more effective in the workplace. And find out where you can make these trainings What different schools offer? Calculate your personal tech training budget and sign up for at least one class per year. And don't ask the tech schools what skills make you more marketable. Ask employers and recruiters. Some of the more unscrupulous tech schools will push you to take certain courses within their curriculum, which may not necessarily provide you with the skills employers want. And identify and take three actions you could take in the next 30 days which will move you closer to achieving this goal and take those actions so let's assume you are interested in changing your career changing your industry you are transitioning to a different career so if you are if you are right now sitting on a desk and I know it's kind of like um, late at night and you're sitting on the desk and you are thinking what am I going to be good at working right you would like I said before you write down all the skills that you know that you um, capable of performing and then sketch out a career path for yourself and it doesn't have to be a complete a sketch just make a start use um, something that you think is going to work out for you so you have to be ambitious and think big 
And if you are floundering around unsure the best career direction, ask yourself this question: What would I do if I knew I could not fail? What industries interest you? Write down the answer. Make a list of three or four industries you would like to research. Describe what interests you about each one. Inside coaches and eventually interviewers are likely to ask you these questions. And what kind of company would be the best fit for you? Would a casual, laid-back company bring out the best in you, or would you thrive in an environment which offers more structure? Describe a work environment which would be fun and bring out your best work. Time for a little research. Which companies in your target industries offer this kind of environment? Who do you know at that company who can give you the straight scoop? If you don't know anyone personally, call 10 people in your network and ask if they know anyone who works for your target company. Ask to be introduced to that person. Make a list of 10 questions to ask your inside coach about their company. Prioritize them in order to of importance to you. So inside coach can be HR executive, HR recruiter. And who in your network is involved in making hiring decisions? Find three or four people who can answer the questions. What impresses you in an applicant? What would be an instant turn off? Begin to get, to get a sense of qualified qualities employers are looking for. And don't be surprised if you find an echo of the enterprise, entrepreneurial, energetic. Uh, more and more companies are willing to bring smart people on board, even with no experience. So if experience didn't matter, what career path would you want to look into? Throw out your current resume. Yes, that's what I said. And don't keep a copy in your desk drawer, just in case you need it. Instead, begin to make a list of your qualifications for the get stuff done degree, what have you done for your previous employers? Emphasize any home runs you have it. What can you be counted upon to produce? And for what business challenge are you a solution? Thinking about those questions really helps you to understand more about yourself, more about you, your capabilities, your strength. And if you don't have the answer, um, you can just message me on Facebook, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah, or email me, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah at gmail.com, and I will guide you through to do all of this together. You are not alone in this. As a career coach, I help people get the job that they want, get the job that they love. So uh, bear with me, listen to my shows. And there might be some answers on the sh previous shows that you can utilize in your uh, interview and in your exercises. I would really love to hear your outcome of ha what happened for the whole week that you do these exercises and what it will happen next week. I would really want to share the successes or if you have any failures, I would love for you to share it with me. If you want it personally on Facebook, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah, or on my group, Let's Talk Careers Inner Circle. I also want to emphasize, when you do these exercises, ask yourself, what are your core competencies? Now, these aren't the things you can do. They are the things that you can do better than anyone else. Abilities that will stand out and be visible to others. If you are not sure what they are, ask people who have worked with you closely. Now let's talk about some uh, about getting a raise, negotiating salaries. So I call it negotiate your piece of the pie. Raises come in many forms. So once upon a time, getting a raise almost always meant getting an increase in base salary. That's the way it was for years and years, decades really. If we were given a raise, it nearly always came in the form of a salary increase. If you showed up on a fairly regular basis, if you were doing good work and not bugging management too much, you were usually given somewhere around a 4% raise every year. 
That was about an average. Now, the rules have changed. Something different is happening, a direct result of the fundamental change in the way we do business today. Something better for the worker. That is different. Companies have had to reinvent themselves. Workers have had to do the same, and compensation packages have had to follow suit. One of the things we are going to examine in this show is the way we view traditional forms of compensation. The almighty raise is the only one component, and likely not the most important, in the compensation package, and it's being offered today. For many people in the workplace today, base salary, while not insignificant by any mean, by any means, is far from being the most important form of compensation. All of which brings me to one of my favorite subjects: How can you make more money? In olden times, you were considered a good worker and given a raise and maybe a promotion, though that was rare. If you worked very hard, and if you were a team player, and if you were on time every day, that's not necessarily the case today. I have a lot of clients who put in long hours, wear their noses out on the grindstone, go the extra mile, love the companies they work for, and yet don't get big raises or the stock options. Why? Because they haven't positioned themselves correctly, nor have they approached the company in the right way. First thing you should go, you should do, is forget the idea that you deserve something because you show up and work hard every day. The company doesn't owe you anything other than an agreed upon salary, and you'll be better off if you approach the issue with that mindset. I'm not saying you shouldn't be rewarded for your performance, but you can't harbor the thinking that you deserve it. I'm sure you all remember the great rallying cry: "Employees are our most important asset." That's probably true as far as it goes. The trouble is, it doesn't go very far. If employees were indeed the most important asset, we wouldn't be seeing the massive layoffs we've seen in the last few years. Companies, for the most part, want to compensate you in a combination of ways rather than just on the basis of base salary. The primary focus is going to be pay, ba- pay based on performance, pay based on value that you bring in the company. In other words, pay, ba- pay based on how much you increase the value of the company. You need to show the company that as a result of what you're doing, you're adding value, that you are increasing the net worth of the company. Again, while there will be, there will always be a place for the drones. And the worker bees, the infantry of the worker workplace, they are the ones who will be locked into three to four percent raises. Moreover, they will be the first ones placed on the waiver wire, or released outright in a merger or acquisition or downsizing, to get ahead and dramatically improve your salary and compensa- compensability. You must think, how can I add? Value to the company. So, with that in mind, I want you to know these best ways to make a lot more money. First is use a proposal format. Anything to do with your compensation, whether it is a promotion, more money, or a piece of the action, needs to be done in a written business-like proposal form. Don't wait till you are so angry or worked up about it that you don't that you can't talk about or write write down your argument. That's not the way to approach any company. First, write up your proposal, articulating why you deserve a raise or increased benefits or a promotion. Next, make an appointment with your boss to discuss your employment. The courtesy will be noted and appreciated. Open with a short verbal presentation. Then leave your prepared document, short and to the point. With a regard to salary issues, always be proactive. Approach your boss. Don't wait for him or her to approach you. You don't want an automatic raise, and in cost of living or inflation adjusted, 
Anyway, if you wait for that, you'll have just joined the ranks of those who are getting 3 or 4% raises. What you hope for, look for in a company in, is flexibility, outside the box thinking, a company that likes the fact that you go to them with an idea or proposal that shows how you can add value, how you increase company worth. As a former manager of sizable company, I can assure you that managers love such approaches to be made in proposal form. They want something they can sit down and evaluate and they don't want to do so in the heat of an annual review. Now is um, compensation is negotiable in almost all companies. Today, though there are some that will maintain rigid salary structures, the key thing here is to focus more on your position than on the actual dollars. That's what you include in your proposal. Here is what my responsibilities are. Here is what I would like to do in the future. Here is how I will do it. Here is what is the work environment will look like. And most important, here is how this will benefit the company. In other words, define what your position will look like as you go forward. Then, companies don't respond well to people who clamor for or demand more money because they are overworked, understaffed, or underpaid. They prefer employees who come to them and say, I'd be willing to have a fair amount of my compensation based on how well the company does, how well I do, or how well my team does. The idea here is to demonstrate that you feel strongly enough about your contributions to the company's success that you are willing to stake at least some of your compensation. Don't go crazy here. Keep it under 30% on the outcome. Companies love that. They like you to have your skin in the game too. Sure, there is some risk involved, but there are also big rewards. And of course, the alternative is to stick with those 3 or 4% raises every year. If you want to get the 10, 20, and 30% raises, yes, they are available. You are going to have to have a stake in the outcome and take ownership of what is going on. It's, how, it's now become very common for new employees in certain segments of today's market, such as high-tech or the legal profession, to get a sign bonus. In each of the four job changes I made in the last five years, I got a signing bonus. The least I was given was $5,000. The top was $20,000. Because of the tight labor market, companies use bonuses as a way to attract good people. And it doesn't just apply to top execs anymore. I saw an ad recently for wait staff in Denver area that included a signing bonus of $1,000. Nurses in some areas are getting up to $5,000. Another bonus that is not as well known, but which is now becoming available, is the retention bonus. If you are good at what you do and the company wants to keep you, this is particularly true in technology. They are often willing to pay you a retention bonus, though I have seen retention bonuses as high as a full year salary. Most commonly, they run to one monthly pay. More obscure yet is the exit bonus. In the case of a merger or acquisition, or if you suddenly find your department's task has been outsourced, you can negotiate the an exit bonus of one or two months salary. In addition to your severance, pay, and whatever else you have coming, but you must remember to ask for it. Make a request for bonus part of your proposal that you submit to your employer. It's often negotiable and it's a way to add more money to your base salary. Next thing is to be flexible. You want the company to view you in a different light. If you want to succeed in the marketplace, phrase like it's not my job or I wasn't hired to do that have no place in your thinking or in your vocabulary. If you are in shipping and receiving, you might well be asked to find a more efficient way to ship widgets to Tierra del Fuego. It is your job, if you, if you hope to get ahead, to meet new responsibilities, propose changes, get the company to look at you in a different light. When it comes to negotiation time, they are going to see that you, that you are bringing more value to the company 
and consequently will be willing to give you a bigger raise. Now, job jumping, once viewed with a disdain by a business community, has become a prominent feature in the landscape of today's job market. I was uh, reading an article uh, the, the other day by a man named James Challenger, a partner in one of the Old Reverend Career counseling companies based in Chicago who said that he felt strategic job jumping was a legitimate strategy. Mr. Challenger is 65 years old, has been in career counseling for almost 40 years, and I can almost guarantee you that his position was far different only a few years ago, but it's more common now. People on both sides of the bargaining table are recognizing job jumping for what it is a legitimate career strategy that can benefit both parties. The worker gets the benefit of current market value or better for his or her labor. The company hiring the worker gets an additional resource, someone with experience and new ideas. Um, now, the career changes are uh, some of the same principles that apply to strategic job jumping apply here too. My own career is a perfect example. When I went from office products industry to the computer technology industry, I changed careers and got a 40% increase in the salary. And it was mainly because I had a lot of experience and success selling to the corporate America. The computer industry at the time had lots of people who were great at technology, but relatively few people who were great at corporate level sales. A client of mine who was an emergency room nurse changed careers to sales and in the first year tripled one amount, the amount of money she made in her best year as a nurse. Granted, such a move can be scary, but it can also be very lucrative. I am running out of time, so that will be another topic we'll discuss in my show perhaps next Wednesday. And I would like to say thank you for those who are listening to me. Thank you so much for um doing your homework, you know, by listening to experts like me about uh, uh, jobs, about resumes, and about um, how to be happy in your in the work environment. So I really want to say thank you again. So I'm going to see you next Wednesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Time on Armed Radio. Let's talk careers with Sarah.